All right, welcome. We are now doing section 14.7b, Absolute Extrema. This is October 3rd. I suppose you should say October 10th, or whenever you get around to watching it. So, what we mean by absolute extrema is that we want a certain point where it is a max or min, not just on some neighborhood, but on the entire domain. So, the way to guarantee that we have a max or min is if our domain is compact and if our function is continuous. Now, compact is a super complicated term definition, but since we are dealing with real numbers and vector spaces, it's easily characterized in this case as being both closed and bounded. If you're going to take real analysis, they make it a lot more complicated. But in this class, it's just closed, meaning it contains its own boundary. And bounded means we can fit it inside of a disk. We can draw a circle around it. So let's see some examples here. So in old regular calculus, it was a closed interval, or perhaps a union of several closed intervals and maybe some individual points. These all count because they have their own boundary and we could put one big interval that contains all of them. Now let's say in R2 then what would it be? So this, let's say we draw some lines and we shade this area, this is closed, but not bounded. It's closed because there are solid lines on the edge, so the boundary is included. But it's not bounded because we can never draw a circle around the whole thing since it goes out to infinity. On the other hand, something like this. This is bounded. It's bounded because I can draw a circle around it. But it's not closed because parts of its boundary are missing. So this is bounded, not closed. So either these are not compact, meaning a function on either one of them, even if it's continuous, might not have a max or min. Or it might. The only way we can guarantee it is if our domain is both closed and bounded. So something like this. This is both closed and bounded. And so in most cases, we would be able to just work it out. But this is a way of saying, like, from the beginning, I could give you this and I could say, find a global max or min. And we know there is some point on here that is the function f, we refer an f continuous on this domain. There's going to be a single spot x, y that is greater than or equal to every other spot and a min as well. So this is a good news, bad news situation. The good news here is when we're dealing with closed domains and when we're trying to find absolute max and min, we don't have to do second partials test. So that whole thing with the discriminant, you don't have to do it for this problem. The bad news is that the boundary could, well, we have to work out the boundary and do it separately. And so we'll talk about how to do that. So a general rule is that open domain <coughs> means we are going to use, we're going to find local extrema. Closed and bounded domain, we're going to find absolute or global extrema. This is not always going to be the way it works, but most of the time, this is the way the problems we presented. If it's closed and bounded, you're going to be looking for absolutes. If it's open, you're going to be looking for locals. 
It could go the other way sometimes, but this is the most common way to see it. Okay. So let's lay out our definitions first, and then we'll do some examples. So definition. We have a function on a domain D. We have a point A, B in D. And we say that A, B is an absolute or global max provided then f of x, y is less than or equal to f of a, b for every x, y, and d. So that means if I pick any other point x, y and plug it into f, I will get no greater than the thing I get at a, b. And minimum is similar, you just reverse the sign. Now I don't say anything about compact here because you can have an absolute max for not being compact, you just might not. But the extreme value theorem is what I just said, that if f is continuous on a closed and bounded set D, then there is a global max and min for f over D. So we'll guarantee to find it in that case. So let's do some counterexamples first, some cases where we might not have an absolute max. So f of x, y equals the set 1 over x squared plus y squared, where the domain is the closed circle, the set of all x, y, where the length of x, y, this is absolute value bars here, the length of x, y is less than or equal to 1. Does this have a global max? Well, let's think about that. We say the domain is the closed circle. That is a compact domain. It is closed and bounded. But there was a hole in the middle. And so the function was 1 over x squared plus y squared. If we let x squared and y squared both get very small, then this is going to go to infinity. We can even say this limit if we go to 0, 0 of this whole thing would be plus infinity, no matter what direction you come from. So this will not have a max. It goes to infinity. And the reason why our extreme value theorem doesn't work is because this function is not continuous on the whole domain. It's got a hole in the middle of it. Now the other one, x squared plus y squared, where d is the open circle. So in this case, open circle here does this have a max well the thing is if there were a max it would have to be on this boundary because you know this is the unit circle so it's radius is one and we know x squared plus y squared is also equal to r squared so r squared would be less or equal to 1. So this would have no max either. And that's because this is, the domain is not closed. It is missing its boundary. The idea being that if there were a max, it would be on this boundary. But since there's no boundary, no matter how close we get, we could always get a little closer to increase a little more. So these are the two cases, the two types of problems where you might not have an absolute max. Either the function is not continuous or the boundary of the domain is missing. All right, so with that out the way, let's now do the problems where we will have it. So this will take a little while, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not all that bad. So... Find the global max and min of f of x, y is x squared minus 2xy plus 2y on the domain x between 0 and 3, y between 0 and 2. This defines a rectangle. So let's go ahead and draw that out. All right, so... Uh, <coughs> So 
So here's 0, 0, 3, 0, 3, 2, and 0, 2. This is our domain. Now, this might be worth, by the way, if you want to go back and look at calc 1, if it were something like, I don't know, f of x is x squared minus 2x plus 3, I don't know, on 0, 1. Or maybe x cubed, so you can't just use quadratic formula. Um, and this was the one-dimensional version of what we're doing now. You would take a derivative set to 0, and then you would also have to check the endpoints. The idea being that the graph might just go straight up like that, in which case the right end would be the max and the left end would be the min, or vice versa. Or it might be there's a max in the middle and then a min over at the edge. So, like I said, I'm not going to review this whole Calc 1 thing. Well, we kind of will in the process of doing this. But the point is, when we had those closed intervals, we always had to check the endpoints. Now that we're in two dimension, the entire boundary counts as the endpoints. Okay, so let me show us how we do this then. All right, so step one, and I'll write out the steps in words as I go, so you want to copy these down if you're the type who likes word instructions. All right, find critical points of the interior. So step one is exactly the same as for the open domain. Um, let's see, f of x, y was x squared minus 2xy plus 2y. Make sure that's what it says on... Yeah. So, we will do the exact same thing here. We'll take the partial derivatives. fx is 2x minus 2y, which will set to 0. fy is negative 2x plus 2 set to zero. Okay, I think we can agree the fy is the easier one to solve, so let's do that. 2x equals 2, so that means x is 1. And we go over here, 2x equals 2y, x is y, so if x is 1, then y is also 1. So our only critical point is 1, 1. All right, so as we do this, we're going to get our critical points and our other things that are kind of like critical points, and we're just going to make a list. So off to the side, you might have a little table. We'll just say an xy on the left and an f of xy on the right. We can call it z if you prefer. So 1, 1 was our first. So now... Step two is parameterize the boundary. Now, this actually has four different parts of the boundaries because it's not smooth. We're not going to be able to find a single function that covers this entire boundary. So we'll split into pieces. C1, C2... C3 and C4. And we're going to have to do these one at a time. So this is the bad news part, is that we have to solve all four of these using Calc 1 techniques. And if you need to refresh those, please come by the calculus table or my office hours. All right, so let's do this. So how do we do this? Okay, let's do them one at a time. So, C1, well, we can see along C1, Y is always zero. And X goes from zero to three. So let's call it R of T is T comma zero where t goes from 0 to 3. 
You could also do this 3t and have t go from 0 to 1. It would, it would amount to the same thing, just different parameterizations. So now we will plug this in. Um, we could list all four of them, or we can do them one at a time. It's really optional. C2, R of T. So along C2, X is 3, and Y varies from 0 to 2. So let's call it 3T, where T goes from 0 to 2. Along C3, now we want to... We're going in this direction, so I'm not sure I know why, but I'm pretty sure you, you don't want to change direction on this. And so we have our, along C3, we're going left. So what I'm going to say instead is I'm going to say, so X starts at 3 and goes to 0. So I'm going to say it is this right 3 minus t comma 2 y is constant 2 where t goes from 0 to 3 if i plug in 0 then x would be 3 if i plug in 3 x would be 0 so this pushes it leftward c4 r of t is so it's similar here x will be 0 and y would be 2 minus t, where t goes from 0 to 2. It's just, as a general rule, when you're making these parameterizations, you want your t to be increasing. It's something to do with if you have it decreasing, then there's a whole chain rule thing and an extra negative, and it, it can really muck things up. So we always want it to be that t is increasing as we go along our paths. All right, so these are our four paths. So you'll want to... Go ahead and copy these down, or screenshot, or however you do it. Um, if this were in regular class, I'd have them up on the sideboard so we wouldn't forget them, but I need to erase to make some space. So then... Erase this... So step three, find critical points of each path. Here's the thing I'm talking about now. At this point, this is a calc one problem because we're going to plug in T for X, zero for Y, and then we'll have a closed interval. See, instead of saying F, we're going to say G of T would be F of T comma zero. Because we have our parameterization for R, for C1, X is T, Y is zero. So we'll create a new function of one variable where we plug in T for X and zero for Y and get T squared. And so now we will do standard calculus one tricks. We will take the derivative here. G prime of t is 2t, which we said equal to 0. So t equals 0. So t is 0 as a critical point, but we also check endpoints. And so the endpoint would be t is 3. So if t is 0, then we plug that back in here, we will get 0, 0. And if t is 3, we'll plug that in and we'll get 3, 0. Now this is exactly the same as the corners. I'll go ahead and tell you the corners will always be in your list. So if you see one of these problems and you just want to speed it up, you can go ahead and put all the corners in your list right to begin with. In this case, it was both a corner and a critical point. All right, so now we have to do C2. So like I said, we have to do this whole process four times because there are four different parts of the boundary. So yes, this is tedious, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not that bad. It just takes a while. 
All right, so we said C2 was um, R of T equals 3T, where T ranges from 0 to 2. So we will plug in 3 for X and T for Y. So G of T is F of 3 comma T which becomes 9 minus 6t plus 6. And so what this now expresses, again, this says as we pass along this path C2, we plug in the time t, and it will give us the height. Did I mess? Hold on, let me double check this. Oh, this should not be a 6. Apologies, this should be a 2t. All right, let's double check that again. 3 squared is 9. It's 3 squared minus 2 times 3 times t plus 2t. That's 9 minus 6t plus 2t. Yeah, that's 9 minus 4t. Now, this is linear. This means that the height is decreasing along the entire path. So we can already tell there won't be any critical numbers. But if you want to verify it, Say g prime of t is negative 4. Set that equal to 0. Well, there's no such number. There's no t that makes negative 4 equal 0. So that's so there are no critical points on this one. I didn't. All right. So, but we do need to include the endpoints. So 3, 2 will now be on our list. Again, the endpoint here is the same as saying when t is 2, we plug in 2 here, and it gives us this point, 3, 2. Switching colors freely, it really means nothing except that I just like to have a little bit of variety. Um. All right. Um. So for C3, it is R of T was, um, let's see, what did we say? 3 minus T comma 2, where T ranges from 0 to 3. So then G of T and R is just the parameterization. G is uh, basically G of T is F of R of T. I've been skipping that step, but that's technically what's happening. It's F of 3 minus T comma 2. So we'll plug in 3 minus T for X, and we'll plug in 2 for Y. So it's 3 minus T squared minus 2 times 3 minus t, times 2, plus 2 times 2, is t squared minus 6t, plus 9, uh, minus 4, times negative t, so plus 4t, uh, let me check this, this is uh, minus 12, all right, we get negative 4, 3 minus t, so that's 4t, Minus 12, yeah, uh, plus 4, is t squared minus 2t, 9 plus 4 is 13, minus 12 is plus 1. Okay, so that's our parameterization here. So this is t squared minus 2t plus 1. That's our height of f z as a function of t yeah if you want to think of it this way it's t feeds into x and y which then feeds into z which is f and so we're basically saying replace the x and y with t so we skip those middle steps Looks like the chain rule. Probably is related to chain rule. Everything in calculus is related to the chain rule somehow or another. 2t minus 2 is 0. 
So solving that gives us t equals 1. Okay, so we do have a critical point this time. So we need to plug in 1 and 0 and 3 into uh, this parameterization to get our point. So if I plug in 0, I get 3, 2, which we already have. If I plug in 1, I would get 2, 2. If I plug in 3, I will get uh, 0, 2. And 0, 2 was the corner. We knew we were going to need it anyway. All right, so now the last boundary is C4. R of T is okay. Let's see, we said X is constant zero and Y is two minus T, where T goes from zero to two. Someone in the calc table earlier, by the way, asked me, could I just use X or Y here? I guess you could, but I like using a new parameterization when I'm trying to replace the two variables. So this is just, as true of most things in math, there's more than one way to do it. I'm just showing you the way that works best for me. And if you want to tweak it a little, it's probably fine as long as you check to make sure it actually works. 0 squared minus 2 times 0 times 2 minus t plus 2 times 2 minus t. So that comes out to 4 minus 2t. Okay, so this is another linear, meaning, you know, a line doesn't have any critical numbers. But, again, you can say g prime of t is negative 2, which never equals 0. So we don't need the critical numbers, just the endpoints. 0 and 2. If we plug in 0, we get 0, 2. If we plug in 2, we get 0, 0, which are both already on our list. Okay, so this is our complete list. So we found all of the critical points that were inside the rectangle. We found all the critical points with respect to the boundaries. And now we are going to test them. And by the way, something like uh, 2, 2. This is not a local max or min. It is not... Um, it is not max on a whole interval because the first derivative is not zero. But it might be that it's greater than everything below it. It might be that, like, it's the max on this half circle. Um, I don't want to be too confused about that, but the point is that if it's on the boundary, it can be an absolute max even if it's not a local max. That's all I was trying to say there, because I, I think there are some questions that will come up with that. Like, So anyway, so step four, plug in all points on the list and it becomes a multiple choice question meaning we know that since this function is continuous it's a polynomial they're continuous everywhere and that since the domain is compact it is closed and we could draw a big circle around it if we needed to we know there has to be a max or min and what we're saying now is the max or min is somewhere in this list so whichever one is the biggest that is our max for the entire domain, the entire D here. Whichever one's smallest sets them in for the entire domain. So we just plug into F. So I plug in 1, 1. F of 1, 1 is 1 squared minus 2 times 1 times 1 plus 2 times 1 is 1 minus 2 plus 2 is 1. F of 0, 0 is just 0. I've already might be doing these faster than I can since I have to erase this thing. F of 3, 0. Well, the y is going to go away, so it's just 9. F of 3, 2 is 9 
minus 2 times 3 times 2 plus 4 would be 9 minus 12 plus 4. That's 1 again. f of 2, 2 is 2 squared minus 2 times 2 times 2 plus 2 times 2 is 4 minus 8 plus 4 is 0. And then f of 0, 2 is 0 squared minus, well that's 0, plus 2 times 2 is 4. Okay, so on this domain, when we say global, we're saying the globe is this entire domain, or absolute. Absolute max is 9, which is found at the point 3, 0. Absolute min is 0, which is at either 0, 0, and 2, 2. You're allowed to have ties for max and min, so it's okay to have it show up in two different places. I will say that with the absolutes, they're more likely to ask you what the output, the z-value is, whereas with the relatives, a lot of times they only care about wh what point it is. So like for, if this were relative max, they might not ask, they might just say 3, 0, but with absolute, they probably want to know what the output is. Because this is statements for the entire domain. It's saying that any point in here, f of x, y, is between 9 and 0. And in fact, we could even say then the range would just be 0 to 9. Because because it's continuous, it's not going to skip. It's not like there's going to be a big gap in between 0 and 9. It's going to have to fill in the entire thing. There are no jumps or anything because it's a continuous function. So that would be a way to do the range. And this can help us a lot, you know, for practical purposes when we do integrals and stuff. A lot of times it's better to be able to estimate. And so if you can say, well, I know it's always between 0 and 9, that gives you like an upper bound and a lower bound. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to deny that was a lot of work. And on a quiz, I will probably give you a problem similar to this, but maybe one with only with a smaller boundary, one that doesn't take quite as long to do. On a test, a problem like this is perfectly valid. You know, takes a while but all right so let's do another problem first this is the in words what I was just showing you and I was writing them out as we went but the steps are to find the critical points of the interior parameterize the boundary, and it may require multiple functions if there are any sharp points in the boundary, find critical points on each path, and then evaluate all critical points and endpoints, including the corners in a table, and choose the greatest and the least. All right, let's do one that's a little easier, or one that's short anyway. Find the absolute maximum minimum of f of xy equals x squared plus y cubed on d is the set of all xy, where x squared plus 4y squared is less than or equal to 4. Now, hopefully, you recognize this is the equation of an ellipse. And since it says less than or equal to, it is a closed domain. And since f is a polynomial, it is continuous. So there will be a max and min. So let's see how we do this one. All right. So f of x, y is x squared plus y cubed with domain is the set of x, y, where x squared plus 4y squared less than or equal to 4. Yeah. All right. 
So I'm going to draw this domain. This is an ellipse. Let's uh, put in standard form x squared over 4 plus y squared over 1 equals 1 is the boundary. The boundary is just where it's equal instead of less than or equal to. So that makes it an ellipse with the major axis going out to 2 and negative 2. The minor axis y going to 1 and negative 1. So something like that. All right. Now we need to parameterize this boundary. And the way to do these is always using the cosine and sine thing. So R of t, so in this case there's only one boundary, which is called C1, or really just C is fine. Uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's do the steps in the orders we have. So F sub x is 2x, which is equal to 0. <coughs> F sub y is 3y squared, which is equal to 0. The only solution here is 0, 0. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is to parameterize the boundary. So it'll be some form of cosine t and sine t. We multiply each one by how far out they get from zero. The length of this semi-major axis is two. So x, we multiply by two. For y, it's one, so it's just one. All right, so on our list we found 0, 0. Let's go ahead and make our list, the xy list here. f of xy is 0. You can see if you plug it in, you get 0. <coughs> so g of t is f of r of t, which is... Uh, let's see, f of 2 cosine t for x and sine t for y, which would be 4 cosine squared t plus sine cubed t. So that is our g. So now we need to Solve the max and min, find the optimization on this as a Calc 1 problem. So let me just slide down a bit here. This, in fact, has no boundary on it. We can say t goes from 0 to 2 pi. But because it goes in a loop, it just keeps repeating itself. So there really are no endpoints in this case because 0 and 2 pi... You know, they both refer to this point to zero. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so now let's take our derivative. So g prime of t is, if it helps, if this notation is bad for you, if it helps you do a chain rule, you can rewrite this as 4 cosine of t squared plus sine of t to the third. This thing with the little twos and little threes, I've always found the notation a bit confusing, but it's pretty standard at this point. This is what it means, though. <clears throat> and doing it this way, I think, is helpful because it helps you remember the chain. Well, there's an outside and an inside function. So g prime of t is, outside function is squared, so it would be 8 cosine t Inside function is cosine, so its derivative is negative sine. And then the second term is cubed. So we get outside function is cubed, so 3 sine squared t. Inside function is sine, <coughs> so its derivative is cosine. So we need to set this equal to 0. All right, so we got to do some trig here. Um, there's a common factor we can pull out. It is sine times cosine. 
So let's rewrite this as sine t cosine t times, and what's left in here is negative 8 plus 3 sine of t. So we have three factors, sine t and cosine t. So we set these equal zero. Sine of t is zero. That would mean t is either zero or pi. Now we won't bother with two pi because it gives the same thing as zero. Cosine t is zero. That means t is either pi halves or three pi halves. And then this last part, negative eight plus three sine t is zero. So 3 sine t is 8. Sine t is 8 over 3. But if you know anything about sine, it only gives values between negative 1 and 1. So this, in fact, has no solutions. So these are, are our t values. So now we'll plug it in here then. And so that, if we plug in t equals 0, and t is the same as the angle theta, if you wish to think of it that way, on the unit circle. <clears throat> so we get the points 2, 0, 0, 1, negative 2, 0, 0, negative 1. So 2, 0... 0, 1. It's not too surprising. It's the, well, I guess you might think of them as the corners of the ellipse. Technically, they're not corners, you know. But they're the they're farthest out points. And so we plug these all into our f function. 2, 0, that'll give us 4. 0, 1 will give us 1. Negative 2, 0 will give us 4. 0, negative 1 will give us negative 1. So min is negative 1, max is 4. Okay, let's do one last problem. Okay, so f of x, y is 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y in the region bound by y equals x squared and y equals 4. So let's get an idea of the picture there. So when we talk about regions bounded, y equals x squared would look like this. y equals 4 would look like this. So that means it's this region in here. So we can see this is two boundary functions, c1 and c2 going in this direction. So the vertex here does not count as a corner because it's a smooth parabola. But these do count as corners. And so you can solve for that if you just said x squared equals 4. y equals 4, so x squared equals 4. So it's 2, 4 and negative 2, 4. So if you want to go ahead and start your x, y list now, We already know 2, 4, and negative 2, 4 are going to be on the list. 0, 0 might be on the list. We don't know yet. All right, so f of x, y was 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y. Right. 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y. All right, so we'll first do the partials. fx is 6x, which is set equal to 0. And fy is 4y minus 4, which we set equal to 0. So we can solve these two problems separately. So x equals 0 and y equals 1. Okay, so 0, 1 is a critical point up here somewhere. And now we need to do the parameterizations of the boundary. And I'm going through a little faster now because you get the hang of it and also because my headphones are dying and I want to make sure I finish before they lose power. Um, so, 
this will be t and t squared, because y equals x squared, so the trick was just say x equals t, and then y equals t squared. Sometimes you do it the other way, but in this case, this is how we want to do it. t needs to go from negative 2 to positive 2. So we'll plug in f of t, t squared, that's g of t, would give us 3t squared plus 2t to the fourth minus 4t squared would be negative t squared plus 2t fourth. So let's do this thing. g prime of t would be 8t cubed minus 2t, which we set equal to 0. So then, fat, let's factor out 2t, 4t squared minus 1 is 0. So, 2t is 0, that means t is 0. 4t squared minus 1 is 0. 4t squared is 1. t squared is 1 over 4. t is plus or minus 1 half. So t is the same as x, we said. So we get negative 1 half, 1 fourth, positive 1 half, 1 fourth. OK, and now all we have to do is c2. That's our last boundary. So we need to parameterize that. So let's do that. Da, 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 da. All right, C2 would be, let's see, so Y is a constant 4. And we want to move to the right, to the left, so let's say T can be, or X be 4 minus T, where T will range from 0 to 8. Let's check that. If I plug in 0, I get 4. No, no, that's not right, is it? It should be 2 minus t, 0 to 4. So if I plug in 0, I get x equals 2. If I plug in 4, I get x equals negative 2. So now I plug these in. g of t is f of 2 minus t, comma 4, is, let's see, <coughs> 3 times 2 minus t squared plus 2 times 4 squared minus 4 times 4, which is, and you could probably do this with chain rule, but I'm going to multiply it out, 3t squared minus 4t plus 4 plus 32 minus 16 uh, 3t squared minus 12t plus 12 plus 16, which, uh, so it's 3t squared minus 12t plus 28. g prime of t is 6t minus 12 equals 0, so 6t equals 12, t is 2. Hmm. So that means we would get, if t is 2, that would mean that we get the point 0, comma 2. So this point up at the top is on there. Here are the points. My notes say zero, 0, is a point, but I can't see why it would be. It wasn't the solution to our previous one. If it's possible I made a mistake somewhere and zero, 0, is in there, I mean, if you're not sure, it can't hurt to add it in there because, yeah. well, no, yeah, because if it was... All right, so now I'm just going to 
trust that you could plug these into the original f function, 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4. So I'm just going to skip to the answers here. So we get 28 for both of these. <clears throat> for 0, 1, we got negative 2. For the 1 half and 1 fourth, for both of those, we get negative 3 over 4. 0, 4. Wait, 0, 4. Oh, shoot. I see where I made the mistake. Um, this is embarrassing. Some of you have probably been yelling at me this whole time. This 2 should be a 4. As I said, t is 0. This is 4. So, oops. All right, so instead of 0, 2, it should be 0, 4. So we get 16. And 0, 0 is 0. doesn't really matter. Like I said, I'm not sure if that was... It doesn't really matter because that's not the max or min. In this case, the max is 28, and the min is negative 2. <coughs> All right, so that covers it like i said there will be a quiz it'll probably be somewhere in between there this i think this third one is about the level of difficulty i'd aim for like the first one took a long time second one was arguably a little too easy this is probably the right balance of what i would expect on a quiz all right so either enjoy your break or if it's sunday night uh, or monday afternoon i hope you did enjoy your break and i'll see you in class